Good morning, team. It has just been under three months since I started as commissioner. As some of you know, I was briefly with the department back in 2016 and 2017, so it's been a great honor to become reacquainted with many of you that I met then. I have always been impressed by our workforce's collective dedication to service to our city, managing one of the most vulnerable populations of our city, the incarcerated population. I have seen a lot over the last two months, and I have spoken to many of you as well as external stakeholders that want the same thing that we do, a Department of Correction that is properly resourced, support the safe custodial care of persons placed in our custody by the courts so that we can enhance public safety in our city. I asked you all to come today because I wanna share with the team my vision for our department and the pathway to achieving safer jails improving our organizational health, and investing in our staff for the future. I also want to thank you for your collective service throughout the pandemic that impacted the world, much of which was on a sustained pause. Although some people were able to telework, you and other law enforcement professionals, as well as our healthcare workers, historically served our city while at the same time managing the impact of the virus had on your respective families and your loved ones. This agency did not get the credit it deserves for managing the spread of COVID-19 within our jails compared to other correctional institutions. Throughout the pandemic, this agency's COVID-19 positivity rate has been lower than the citywide average. And you should be proud and give yourselves a round of applause for that work. So thank you for what you did. I am humbled to lead this department at this time of crisis. And I am inspired by the commitment to public service embodied in our staff. In thinking about how we move forward, it is important to recognize where we are at and acknowledge our problems. A history of underinvestment, self-serving priorities, coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, led to a deterioration of conditions, an overworked labor force, rising levels of violence, and an understandable concern for safety. The conditions in our city's jail today are unacceptable. The department is in serious need of reform. Our staff, the people in custody, deserve dignity and safety. And it is our moral obligation to protect everyone in our facilities, including those individuals entrusted in our custodial care. We must pursue swift action that supports our staff, improve the conditions of our facilities, and maintain safety for staff and all people impacted by incarceration in New York City. More violent offenders are being placed in our custody and staying in our care longer due to the department's admissions outpacing our discharges. Nearly every month from May 2020 to August of 2021, the admissions have exceeded our discharges. The pandemic impacted court operations, delayed state transfer to New York State docks, these are contributing factors that have significantly increased the length of stay for the detainee population. From January 2019 to January of this year, the average length of stay for incarcerated detainees went from 187 days to 329 days in January of 2022. To place this into perspective, our department's length of stay is four times longer than Los Angeles County, which is the largest jail system in America. These lengths of stay continue to impact us today. We expect our population may increase further over the coming months. Violent crime trends are seasonal, so we anticipate more admissions in the spring and summer months, and the city's gun violence initiative may also lead to more jail admissions. This is why it is vital that we take action now and prepare for that. Our most vital resource is our staff, and while our incarcerated population has been steadily increasing, the department's uniform workforce has decreased significantly. The department today has nearly 2,000 fewer correction officers at the end of December 2021 than it did in 2019. This attrition of staff coupled with the staff that was unavailable because of the impact of the virus pandemic surges and other medical needs caused over 30% of our uniform staff to be unavailable. But there is a bit of good news. We are experiencing a few positive trends we have been focusing on our unavailable staff, and we have made significant process over the last two months. 
We have had over 1,300 uniform staff return to work since the beginning of this year. And we lowered the percentage of unavailable staff from over 30% to approximately 90, 19%. But I want to be clear, while this trend is promising, we still have a long way to go to get our staffing numbers back to normal. With that said, calendar year to date, staff availability is encouraging and has allowed us to return the majority of our facilities back to eight hour tours. This also allowed us to bring back external contract providers to deliver services alongside our DOC program staff. And we recently restarted in-person family visits. Now we are also seeing positive safety and security indicators moving in the right direction. Assaults on our uniform staff calendar year to date have decreased 19%. Assaults on our non-uniform staff in the same time year-to-date frame has decreased 46%. And use of force calendar year-to-date has decreased 25%. But let me be clear, we cannot and we will not tolerate acts of violence on staff and other persons that are placed in our custody. We cannot normalize being assaulted simply for doing your job or simply because you're a detainee in our facility. Although it is still early in the year, I would like to see these trends continue to decrease over the year. Last year, we saw a record number of slashing and stabbings in our facilities, and this trend has continued this year. This is one of my main focuses. This type and level of violence are absolutely unacceptable and it cannot be tolerated. Working closely with our acting chief of security, we have begun conducting tactical search operations, as well as increased unscheduled searches. We need to find and remove weapons from our facilities, and that work has begun. The department is also moving away from housing persons by their gang affiliation, and we're working with our classification and custody management team. We have started to rebalance the housing units, starting with our young adult population, and we'll continue this rebalancing effort. Instead of using a two-tiered conflicting system as the department has over the past several years, we are instead going to rely on one classification system that meets our needs. This is a simple change, but that will relieve confusion and potential issues. In time, this will reduce acts of violence and enhance safety for staff and the people that are in our custody. We must focus also on our failing and aging facility infrastructure. We haven't made any significant investment in our facilities in decades. Our staff, the people in custody, deserve to work and live in a safe and decent environment. I can't, we can't in good conscience, let this go on any further. I just shared some of the challenges inherited during our first couple of months in 2022 from the past. And I know that these issues are not new to many of you. These are areas are absolutely critical to our department's operation and success. And some of the early trends I have shared are a signal that we are moving in the right direction. But as I mentioned earlier, we need to refocus our efforts to align our policies and security procedures with correctional best practices. Practices that provide staff the tools and authority to create and uphold safe and orderly facilities. A lot of this department's challenges with staff center around staff feeling as though they are not supported, often because our policies and operational expectations may not be straightforward or speak to the reality of their jobs. Other times our policies are simply outdated and not aligned with current research. We are undertaking a review of our policies to ensure that they are attainable, realistic, and straightforward. We've already taken actions to streamline our classification process, rebalance our housing units. In addition, we must also invest in our staff's wellness and improve the conditions that they work in every day. I think you all agree that working in corrections is one of the toughest jobs in law enforcement. The support for our staff must start and continue from the leadership in this room. This is also mission critical to the prospect of recruiting people to work here for both our uniform and our yarn uniform positions. The work is already challenging at the very least, and we need to create a supportive work environment for each other. Our expectations for staff must be attainable and clear. And our process for staff accountability needs to focus on improving results, not gotcha moments and heavy-handed disciplinary tactics. As leaders, we can't also be expected to know everything. It is equally important that we must self-reflect and identify areas where we need to grow. 
Therefore, we will have professional development opportunities for mid-level and senior leadership to help you support your team and collectively execute the mission of this agency. Together, we can leverage all of our shared experiences and institutional knowledge to solve problems. So we have streamlined the leadership structure, removed unnecessary layers of the organizational chart so that we can empower subject area experts and leverage organizational knowledge and experience. We are still building our leadership team, and I will ask that you all support them and leverage their skills to tackle our challenges. We also need to rely on data in both our short-term decision-making and our long-term planning, aligning our operational decision-making through evidence-based approaches. It is important we instill in the public trust in how we are managing this agency and using data to support our operational decisions will be critical to rebuilding that trust. We also need to deploy staff we have available efficiently throughout our facilities and we need to pursue aggressive strategies to bring more of our staff back to work. Not only do we need to have more of our staff available to work each day, but we also need to ensure that we are efficiently using staff who are available. We are looking at a way we are deploying staff and specifically also assessing staff who are on modified duty in order to ensure that they are being used to the agency most beneficially. We've taken actions to reassign and or redeploy staff who are not on modified duty to ensure that the staff who can't have contact with the population are working in detainee-facing posts. We are also looking to ensure our staffing levels are responsive to the population's medical, programmatic, and security needs, so we can ensure staff feel safe on their posts and are able to provide the services required to our population. As I mentioned before, we need to ensure our staff feel supported in their work. They have incredibly difficult jobs and we need to prioritize their wellness in order to maintain high standards for their performance. When we encounter instances where staff are not performing up to our expectations, and when corrective action is necessary, we need to ensure it is pragmatic and leads to improvement. In the same way that we cannot punish our way out of misbehavior amongst our, our detainee population, we cannot punish our way through staff accountability. We're going to ensure that our staff accountability system is fair, transparent, timely, and meaningful, and most importantly, that it addresses issues. I spent time today talking about our staff, the agency's policies, and our organization, and I know I've covered a lot of information, but I want to take some time on this because in many ways, it guides our work. As I see it, we need to have our staff at work, we need to have efficient policies. We need to ensure safety in our facilities. And we need all these things so that we can provide targeted services to the people that are placed in our custodial care. And the services that we provide need to be evidence-based, they need to be impactful, and they need to be targeted so that they are responsive to the individual needs of the people that are participating in them. In that light, I'm increasing a focus on credible messengers to get through to our young adult population and work specifically to interrupt violence and gang issues. Although our population has decreased over the decade, we are now dealing with the much more challenging individuals and some people with mental health issues and co-occurring substance abuse addictions. We are also continuing to prioritize escorts to medical appointments and working with our partners at Correctional Health Services to ensure that the people produced for appointments are being seen because the physical and mental wellness of the population is critical to our agency's success. We absolutely must provide people in custody support, opportunity, and most importantly, belief in change. We need to leverage our passionate workforce of programming and counseling staff, as well as our external providers and our uniform staff to transform our facilities into learning environments. This work that I've outlined so far requires collaboration at all levels. Now, this agency has historically been defensive in its relationship with oversight bodies and community stakeholders. That needs to change. We need to be more transparent, we need to communicate our issues, and we need to rely on their support. We can't expect oversight bodies to understand our challenges and our related needs if we do not communicate with them and build trust through consistent action. 
To put it simply, we need to meet our commitments. I've met our oversight bodies internally, and I'm committed to continuing to keep those lines of communication open and accessible. We also need to continue working closely with our dedicated health partners at Correctional Health Services to ensure that we maintain high standard of care for physical health, mental health, and addiction-related needs. I know I've covered a lot here, and we're still only a little bit more than two months into this work, but I want to impress the need for urgency and collaboration moving forward. We also need support from the community and the leaders of this city to ensure that we have the resources to take the necessary actions to support our staff and to ensure that our facilities are safe and productive for the people in our care. We need to remember that our work impacts our communities directly. When we keep our facilities safe, we are also keeping the city safe. This agency's current challenges were many years in the making, and as a result, the department needs swift and decisive action. Changes have started. We must all put the era of waste and mismanagement behind us. My message is more than just words. It's about taking action and reclaiming this agency to be the premier correctional institution in the country. We have been there before, and we can do it again. All of you here, your staff, are the solutions to our problems, but we need to hold ourselves accountable, continue to work hard, respect each other's role, and collectively, as Mayor Adams always says, get stuff done. We can do this, so let's get to work, and thank you for your time.